but first. I make no assumptions that all of you know exactly who my mother was or that much about her. So I would like to let us get to know her a little bit. Naomi Ellen Judd, nay Diana, was born on the 11th of January, 1946 in Ashland, Kentucky, a small coal town in Appalachia. Later taking her identity into her own hands, as was her wont, she changed her name to Naomi and her parents were young. Pauline Ruth was just a teenager when Diana was born and her daddy Glenn had an Ashland oil fill-in station and the coldest Coca-Colas in town. The eldest of four children, Naomi wrote in her own hand on the back of a baby picture, was always smiling. Belonging and connection were urgently important to her, and it was she, even as a youngster, who remembered everyone's birthdays. She believed there was a crocodile in the basement. His name was Gillette because his teeth were razor sharp. Unexpectedly pregnant at 17 while her family was falling apart as her younger brother Brian was dying of a childhood cancer. She married a boy who was not the, the child's father, which was not totally uncommon at that time. And then she gave birth again at 22 to me. Full of yearning, Naomi was restless. The emergence of her older daughter's unmistakable musical brilliance at about the tender age of eight midwifed in her a dream, a spectacular technicolor dream that broke with her family's humble heritage. Who knows, who knows where her powerful imagination came from? Perhaps the books at the library on Central Avenue in Ashland, Kentucky. She cultivated preternatural mother-daughter harmonies and eventual stardom, the result was that she became an icon and a legend who left country music better than she found it. Naomi was complex and dynamic. She was every woman, a nurse, a single mother who was sometimes living on public assistance. She was a survivor of early childhood sexual abuse at the hands of her uncle Charlie, as well as intimate partner violence, a rape about which she spoke very boldly, and she lost a job when she wouldn't go away with the male boss for the weekend, leaving her in deep trouble when she tried to pay the rent for my sister and me. She was mamma to her grandchildren and to my chosen family. And she was totally extraordinary. She sold millions of records. She was a five-time Grammy Award winner and a Hall of Famer, lauded by millions. And this part, a lot of people don't know. She was totally brilliant and loved the Nobel laureates and pioneers of science with whom she kept company. From the current Nobel laureates, Vante Pablo, to Marvin Minsky, <laughs> whose name she loved to drop. <laughs> From Dr. Collins, Francis, for whom she wrote the ditty, The Big Bang Boogie. <laughs> and to Dr. Tim White, who led the discovery of the earliest hominid uh, skeleton, Artie, and Maya Angelou were mult, mult, mutually adoring of each other. These folks were her friends and her conversation partners and came to stay at our farm. And she was besotted with neuroscience and kept fat volumes on her bedside table, which she read daily. And she was also my mama. She was soft and she smelled pretty. Her smile melted me and she hugged me all the time and told me I was her darling and her sweet pea. She bought me Whoppers from Walgreens, and she made lavish Easter baskets even when I was all grown up. Every time she went out to eat, she asked me if I was hungry, especially if they had anything with hot fudge on the menu. She came to all my chosen family gatherings because she loved my people and they loved her. And when I asked her about being that named source and Jody Cantor and Megan Tui's Pulitzer Prize winning reporting on Harvey Weinstein, she said, oh honey, go get him. And when I was campaigning for the candidate of my choice and the most recent in the, in the presidential election before last, she thought my candidate was wackadoodle, but I knew her candidate was wackadoodle. And she came up to support me anyway and watched me speak, and she was in full hair and makeup. She didn't slouch and hide in the back, and afterwards she said, oh, honey, you were perfect. They're so lucky to have you. And when I spoke at the Women's March in 2017, she was 
she told me she was enthralled by my audacity, even though her favorite news channel gave me a lickin. <laughs> she was a good mother to me. She was a good mother. And she had a disease that lied to her, that was an unfair foe, that lived rent-free in her head and caused her irreparable suffering, and eventually made her hurt so badly that she believed on that day that she would only get worse and never better. Her disease was a thief. It took her hope, and it took her life.